on it. Ah, my favourite patient. How have we been this week? Well, Lynchrink, I've just lost all faith in humanity as a whole. How can bad things consistently happen to good mm, people? A common issue. I'll just check my cabinet and see what I can prescribe. But that's a DVD cabinet, filled entirely with David Lynch films. It's not a medicine cabinet. So it is. You know I'm not actually a qualified physician, right? I just stand art house directors. Yeah, I know. I just come here for the company. How about this? A stirring tale of two friends from a different world who discover the meaning of true friendship and inner beauty. The Elephant Man. That should help, right? No, you don't understand. I watched that already. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm so in my feelings. How can we live in a world where beautiful souls like John Merrick live such torturous lives? Oh, so is that a yes or no to the DVD? Yeah, go on then. Let's watch it and talk about it for around um, half an hour. Cool. Um, huh? Um, what? DVD. I think I asked you last time, did you know what you're in for? And I realized when I first started watching this, I never have any idea what I'm in for when I watch a David Lynch film. Immediately you get thrown in the deep end, don't you? It starts with a very similar kind of shot to a razor head. It's the same idea of like conception and like something being so superimposed over a face. And here it's obviously John Merrick's mother being like kicked over by an elephant, like this semi kind of mythological tale, which is how he potentially got his disabilities. And that's how the film opens. And it's just this weird shot of like trooping elephants and very weird yeah it's definitely the most lynchian scenes uh, the the scenes that bookend the film the the opening scene is um is it the way that john merrick understands himself to have come about it's like What's the kind Lynch of tale they there? tell yeah. at the carnival isn't it like the fake version that might not be completely true of how the elephant man was formed we see anthony hopkins who is very sexy in this film i think he's got like the whole victorian beard <laughs> thing going on and um, he's doing it he's definitely he's definitely very good in this film yeah um <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry i shouldn't i shouldn't i shouldn't sexualize him should he he's, he's also a very very good actor in this film yeah yes. one of wales's finest acting exports of is which he Welsh? Been a few. yeah he sure is yeah yeah he's quite a bit younger than richard burton but a rumor always went around the hollywood that they were or just generally that they were friends somehow because they were both sort of from near Patul but, but they're um, they, they didn't really know each other very well they just sort of met once or twice Being kind of racist well. to assume that isn't it the two it, it, it is <laughs> it is you well she's all know each other yeah exactly <laughs> it's but. quite a small country but like not that small no, that's small. <laughs> so Anthony Hopkins, I've, I have done like no research. What's the name of his character again? Um, Doctor, <laughs> Doctor something. Doctor Treves. Yeah, the Dr. main Dr. character Treves. of the film, Doctor Doctor Treves. He he arrives yeah. at the carnival and bites. Right, is the guy who's kind of bites is the evil man. Yeah, he refers to himself as the elephant man's owner, doesn't he? Oh and, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. He does. Hopkins, oh. when he's speaking to John Merrick, he says, "You know that man who's your owner," and he has to stop himself from saying owner. He catches himself in the act. So to start with, it's kind of like the um, like the shark in Jaws. Like they kind of underuse it, and you don't really see that much of him. And I didn't know if that was going to be the whole film. And obviously, basically yeah. the last two thirds, you just see loads and loads of shots of him really close up as well and the effect is um pretty great it's it's definitely one of the things that jumps out is the, the way that they deliberately restrict your views of the elephant man you get a tiny glimpse when anthony hopkins character goes to see him the tiniest split second and then the rest of the time it's how people react to him so when hopkins first lays eyes on him it's a very it almost cliched it's it's a it's a sort of slow zoom in on his face and then a single tear rolling down his cheek this film is it packs no punches or pulls no punches. Sorry, um, when uh, uh, in terms of the kind of emotional weight of it, there's no holding back. In the way that a razor head was darkly funny in many ways, um, the Elephant Man is it, it, it's very hard to read it in any other way. It's um, uh, very emotionally compelling. And, and like you um, say, yeah. that shot of the slow zoom and then the tear that in any other film I think could have been very very cliche. But there's so much like pathos in this film, and it's so visceral, and you really feel for this guy. It's kind kind of a character study, would you say, of partly of Anthony Hopkins' character and partly of John Merrick. The whole nature of biopics is really interesting, and and 
with this film. It, it's based on the real life memoirs of Dr. Treves. And they, they were friends and they knew each other as, as is shown in the film. You know, Dr. Treves, he takes the Elephant Man in. And there's a lot about the Elephant Man, about Merrick, that we just don't know. We don't know his background. We don't know how he got there. And we don't really get inside of his perspective on things that much, his sensibility. We can't fully understand what it's really like to be him. So it's almost about Treves' encounter with the Elephant Man more than it is about the Elephant Man himself. In They're Obi's really reading. specific about that at the end, aren't they? They say this is based on the actual life story of the Elephant Man and not any other uh, portrayals of it you might have seen. I don't know if that was like so, a legal thing or if they put that up there just to kind of... I can imagine David Lynch wanting to be very particular and be like, yeah, this is actually my own work. And it was at the time when the play of the Elephant Man came out, wasn't it, as well? Have you seen that at all? No, I don't know how it was. David Bowie, Bowie was in it, yeah. Oh, is it really? And he doesn't wear any makeup or any anything to resemble the Elephant Man except the, his gait and his sort of posture. So Anthony Hopkins' character, I think we're going to keep calling him Anthony Hopkins, aren't we, basically? Yeah. But um, he takes this guy kind of under his wing. So at first he's kind of trying to secret him away in like the top floor of a room. Um, mm. The guy who's running it kind of has this whole attitude where he's like, we don't care for incurables. And you get that kind of sense of the times where disabilities probably weren't um, looked at in the most compassionate light, especially like severe ones like John Merrick's that are pretty much completely incurable and not even really treatable, to be honest. The whole film he's kind of slowly dying, isn't he? And ha- having liberated him from bites, you do feel a great sense of relief that he's finally in safe hands, but then that unease sets back in as soon as the other people at the hospital are like, well, why is he here? It feels like nowhere's really safe for Merrick. And, um... Well, at first, I didn't even really know that Anthony Hopkins was on his side or not, if he, or if he was in it for kind of his own good. He's, I think he's mainly known for playing, like, villains I've seen. Yeah, so. that's true. <laughs> and he comes in right at the start and there's that bit where there's like you see him shot through the curtain and he's like gesturing him at him with this stick and it's like really kind of making him into a stage show and it's almost worse than it was before because now it's in front of all these like academic I, I think that's one of the best scenes in the film in terms of Lynch's directing at that point in the film the length of the scenes is, is quite interesting so so the lecture opens literally on the projector switching on and it's the scene is the lecture not a second before not a second after the projector comes on and you know Anthony Hopkins he's in front of these other professors and great doctors of medicine it feels very much like you know a sideshow circus act like he was but for these high society doctors rather than the, the London rabble so to speak and we, we don't see Merrick at all except through the silhouette we just see the horrified audience and the way Hopkins Hopkins talks about it. It's very dehumanizing, isn't it? Interestingly, the genitals are perfectly normal. It's just kind of, and Merrick's just standing there. And it's um, at that point, you don't know quite what Hopkins has in store for him, do you? But as the film progresses, you do kind of see that he does really care for this guy and he is trying to look out for him at the end of the day. I mean, there's that scene where the doctor comes in and is trying to kick him out. It's quite for a, a joyous moment, isn't it? Turns out he knows the Psalm, Psalm 23 all along and then he's able to... It takes a lot of time for, for, for Merrick to even be able to speak. Well, the yeah. kicker is that he's reading out this thing and it's at this point where they've already kind of made the decision and they're walking away, aren't they? And then yes, Anthony Hopkins kind of stops and he goes, I didn't teach him that part, so he must be able to read. And it, that, you're, you're right, it's a really liberating moment. One that's few and far between in the very depressing overall tone of this film. It um, is, it's definitely worth mentioning just how bleak the tone generally is. It's very almost Dickensian, isn't it, in its portrayal of like, East End London in the Victorian time. Yeah, there are a little lot. like chimney sweep boys running around with coal on their faces and stuff. Uh, I mean, we've not even mentioned that it's shot in black and white, have we? Which I think... Oh, of course, yeah. Basically unheard of for a director to do his two first films and them to be completely different but both share something like that first so we see John Merrick mainly for like the first act of the film either in his disguise that he has where he almost has like this sack over his head with like a hole cut out of it and this big kind of coat and the hat and you can kind of tell from his walk there is something off there but he almost kind of fits in and then we have the the lecture scene which establishes kind of the extent of um, I don't know if you'd say deformities or condition I don't know what's the nicer way 
because I care about John Merrick, man. I, ca- I, I I cried, I think, at the end of this film. That's kind of the natural reaction, really, isn't it? As, um, <laughs> you're made of stone if you don't, really. I wrote down a random thought. I said it was almost like the male version of The Notebook, and it's a film that lots of boys can get together and just kind of like weep <laughs> together and not feel ashamed because... Uh, the... It's a David Lynch film. <laughs> <laughs> there are obviously lots of Lynchian elements. Like There's lots of use of fire, and fire looks fucking amazing in black and white. Like, I could just watch a fire in black and white all, all day and like the set design obviously kind of like i don't know if you would call it creature design or if that's offensive to call it that but in the same way that like the baby from Razorhead is a prop the makeup they've applied to john hurt is kind of a prop in this as well and you hear those insane stories about it took like eight hours to apply every yeah. day and two hours to take off i guess that kind of adds if you're playing that character you're kind of going through a struggle in a certain way by having to sit there for that time and obviously pales in comparison to what the real john merrick would have gone through but maybe Maybe that helped him kind of get in the mindset, I think. But he's unrecognizable in this role, is he? Like, um, I know John Hurt from Alien, and he played one of the doctors, didn't he? You wouldn't know it was him if you, no, someone didn't tell you, because yeah. he is literally, like, his whole thing is prosthetic and covered up for a lot of the film. He is excellent in this film, isn't he, John Hurt? And it's mainly voice oh. stuff that he's doing, I think, kind of, almost. There, I guess there are a couple of close-ups on the mouth, and he's kind of, like, operating that. And the eyes, the eyes convey, like, so much emotion. And it's terms of sad, it, is, it is incredibly sad. <laughs> <laughs> it puts you in a real funk, this film, like, which it should. <laughs> in terms of Lynchian tropes as well, like what you were saying about the, the there's a lot of kind of gaslighting and stuff as well, isn't there? And not the not the um, rhetorical gaslighting. I mean, literally <laughs> gaslit hospitals and stuff. And, and uh, even the carnival, I don't know where it's supposed to be because it's like this kind of basement and it's got like these stone walls and arches and stuff. Kind of doesn't make sense as a real place. Maybe coming back to that dream logic we were talking about with the razor head. But for the most part, this is a pretty much straight down the line story that it's telling and very mainstream and surprisingly emotional and human for it. David Lynch film is apart yeah. from those like three dream sequences that kind of at the start the middle and the end very yeah. much just a regular plot and he can be so effective I don't know if why he didn't do more films like this because he clearly is great at telling this kind of story Definitely. I guess June June probably fucked him up but we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about that <laughs> next episode I guess we should say because it does come into play later that John Merrick has to sleep sat up due to his condition um, because if he sleeps lying down then he will like suffocate and he has this picture that's quite lynching you know, actually the picture he has in his wall of like the woman sleeping and he kind of looks up to that as a basic human thing that we all can do but he can't because of his genetics it's very sad Josh <laughs> I think we're just going to keep coming back to that incredibly oh, bad <laughs> There's a lot of evil in this film in terms of the way that people react with horror to, to Merrick and uh, just dehumanizing him in every way. But there's kind of two very evil characters. There's Bites, who is the man's keeper at the beginning. And then there's this, this man who should never have a job. And it, I think he was invented for the film. He's certainly not a yeah, um, yeah, real character. The, the drunken porter who uh, bursts into the elephant man's room at night and then sees it senses an opportunity to turn him into his own personal freak show and it and the, the porters kind of are eye into the CD underbelly of Victorian East End London um, and then there's the scene of absolute terror when he invites them into his room and the porter's kind of trying to make um, a living out of him but I think also kind of getting off on the fact that he can horrify people and using that as a way to get into women's pants which I can't believe is that successful but he breaks in with two women and they kind of like force them to kiss John Merrick and he really doesn't want to and they all duck also don't want to but they kind of go along with it due to peer pressure and no one really wants to be doing it and he's obviously just traumatized and it's probably like his first something that even resembles like a sexual experience and it's being like forced upon him and they pour it's excruciating like, isn't it yes. to watch horrible and they pour like alcohol down his throat and they hold up a mirror to his face which i think is one of the worst bits of the whole thing because i guess 
he doesn't really look at himself that much. Like he's dressing himself up and he's trying, he wants to appear like much like a normal person as he possibly can. And they just kind of strip back that illusion by showing him this mirror and being like, you're never going to be one of us, like know your place kind of thing. And it's yeah, completely, completely horrible. And, and it's sort of the way it's directed, it's almost like a choreographed dance number at one point, isn't it? With the music in a film full of very difficult scenes to watch, it's probably the hardest to watch. And it's right before Bites um, recaptures Merrick and uh, takes him to Belgium. And Trees yeah, of- hasn't really looked up, hasn't really done his job of looking after him there by allowing this man to be employed in i don't know if you can blame treves that much but i yeah i get, I get what you're saying he, he was already anguished over the question of am i just using merrick as, as someone to show off to my high society friends how philanthropic that, i am that seems and, right before isn't it before the um scene where they break in it's like he has this breakdown and says like am i a bad man am i using this guy but at least he's having this moral conflict so that kind of clearly gives you the answer to the question. While these people are just, they don't even see him as human, really, do they? Because there are certain people throughout the film who react to him, and I think that's more just of shock of seeing something that is, like, so abnormal. And you can't really blame them for that, I don't think. But then there are other people, um, the two villains, as you say. It's a very clear-cut sense of, like, good and evil in this film. And these two villains who genuinely just are pieces of shit. Yeah, pretty much. Treve's wife, she does reiterate to him that like, you, you know you've given him this like quantifiable terms his life is so much better than it had been you know it is a, it does raise interesting questions about the kind of nature of charity and philanthropy and in, in a sort of broader sense about to what extent it comes from a desire to be a generous person yourself rather than actually about the person you're helping the, um, <laughs> he, he ends up at this uh, the, the circus he said it was in Belgium I don't know if I caught that I think it was in Bel- in Ostend yeah and and he's gone back to how he was before and he's kind of even worse off because Bites is now like drinking even more and even more out to get him and having have had to run away from London because he's too well known now. They use the constant device of the papers kind of publishing stories about him throughout. So there is this idea he becomes a kind of quasi celebrity and like a spectacle. So I guess that links back to what we were saying where is what and is what Anthony Hopkins doing to him just a different version of what was in the carnival? To God, some extent it kind of is, isn't it? But even though Merrick's life is so much better it's tricky and that's the core sadness i think at the heart of this film is that he would never be able to have a life that wouldn't be because of the way that he is right at the end there is that one moment kind of the last good day thing where he's at the opera and everyone kind of stands up for him and like claps for him yeah that's a standing ovation and that's a really beautiful moment and that's probably the closest he was ever going to come to being accepted after that he makes the decision to to lie down and um take his own life it's very uh, very sad josh actually very sad, yeah because <laughs> he has a kind of love of beauty and the arts and beautiful things be it like the bible or um shakespeare and then um there, he can see a church outside of his window throughout the film yeah. but he never really gets to properly see it but he has a build your own is it sort of made out of card and that gets crushed i don't, during- I don't think it's like a construction kit is that what you're saying i think he makes it himself really sure doesn't he? oh he makes it himself oh, I, sorry, I think I, he I, makes I, it himself it'd be weird if he just like anthony hopkins went down to like the local post office and like got him a model and... but he's he's been making this he's been constructing this church in his little um windowsill of uh, and it gets crushed during the breaking where he's kidnapped which which is very visually distressing kind of image of you know his dreams being crushed for and then he finally completes it at the end so it's on, on his perfect day and his love of kind of beauty is um one of the things that the film uses to reiterate his humanity i think that and the performance of john hurt like it's a very kind of like well-mannered and kind of heartbreaking how almost accepting he is of his fate Uh, there's that scene where he asks anthony hopkins can you cure me and he says well we can care for you we can't cure you and he goes yeah i I thought that was probably the case he's willing to kind of accept that that's what's happening to him hopkins just immediately dismisses the idea you know, r- r- rightly that, you know, no, there's nothing we can do for you. Before we watch this film, the, the one moment you mentioned before as the kind of the standout moment that everyone knows, the scene at the station when he's, so he's managed to escape from Belgium. He's been locked in a cage with baboons screaming at him. It's, and then the other so-called freak who are in the circus in Belgium uh, are really nice and they... Uh, yeah, they help him escape, don't they? And the um, lead little person 
credited as Plume Dwarf is played by Kenny Baker, who I just watched for in Time Bandits with Adrian uh, by Terry Gilliam and was RTD2 probably most famously. Which again is like the Star Wars connection with David Lynch maybe directing Return of the Jedi. That was, I don't know if Kenny Baker was like the man who set that up or if he was just coincidentally in both productions because they needed a little person actor. But And another interesting connection, this was produced by Mel Brooks, I believe. That's true. Yeah. And he didn't want himself to be credited because people would expect a comedy, which again, we must emphasize this. <laughs> There's nothing funny in this film. So uh, he quite understandably, Mel Brooks, thought it best remove his name from the uh, from the poster and the credits. So not even under like a pseudonym or anything. He literally is not credited. I think that's right. Because uh, then when did uh, it come out? Did he like 20 years later, he was like, by the way, guys, I produced The Elephant Man. Don't know if you guys need it. And Mel Brooks, we should probably say, is mainly known for like kind of obscene comedy films like Blazing Saddles and the producers. So His comic counterpart, uh, Carl Reiner just died a few days ago, didn't he? Yeah, I saw that. Mel Brooks still alive in his 90s now. I've written, are the elephants sperm? It starts with a con- scene of conception right at the start. And you have this like parade of elephants coming by. Are they going into the uterus to fertilize the egg and make the elephant man? Is that what David Lynch is trying to do? Because I wouldn't put it past him, Josh. Having watched the razor head, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to <laughs> assume. I think the rating scale we should use from now on is like how many testicles out of five you give this film. Because they're very, like, (laughs) everything is, like, a little bit sexual. I wouldn't even say phallic, because I think phallic kind of implies the shaft, and Lynch is also working working the balls as well. There's even a shot halfway through where a guy's, like, playing a musical instrument, but it's not a regular musical instrument. It's like a ball with a trumpet coming out of it. I'll put it in the video. I think sometimes you just see what you want to see. (laughs) (laughs) I think I read that Lynch was working as a roofer, so he didn't really have a film career at the point where he was asked to make this film. So it's kind of odd that he would choose, because he's not British, so choosing like a very British story to adapt, yeah. casting British actors, this kind of period piece is a very kind of weird move for him. And I don't know how well the story was known in, in the United States before the film came out. He's somewhat, he's a name that you kind of know from a young age, I feel like, being from, from the UK. It's, it's a very famous story. I read that Brooks chose him to to direct it after having seen he hadn't heard of him but then he saw a razor head and was just overwhelmed by it and was like oh we've got to get him to do this film but i don't know what drew lynch in necessarily so they optioned the script they showed it to mel brooks mel brooks decided that he wanted to make it and finance it and then his personal assistant but he suggested mel brooks personal assistant suggested david lynch as a thing david lynch read the script and loved it so he wasn't really like involved maybe in the writing side which is maybe why it's more traditional kind of hollywood narrative rather than fucking raise a head which is very out there and yeah not your standard plot of a film he's um, he's it's certainly not his kind of, and personal vision the whole thing i get he, he's he's part of a team isn't he with um jonathan sanger the producer i okay. I was about to get to the scene at the station, but I took it off on a tangent. Because the thing that you said to me before having watched this film was um, the scene where he gets cornered at the station when he's just come back from Belgium. And he, um, what did you think of that scene when, when he exclaims, I, I am a human being, I am not an elephant. Merit not an Grace. animal. <laughs> Josh, no, I am said. not an elephant. I would have been <laughs> not an animal. maybe so. less poignant. Sorry, that's <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of the moment where he finally stands up for himself, isn't he? He's this very mild-mannered man, which is especially impressive because the universe hasn't really done anything for him. You'd expect him to kind of be, like, twisted and resentful. You just get the impression he's this really nice guy who just wants to try and live as normal a life as possible. And finally, after, like, the upteenth time where he's facing just horrible discrimination for nothing more than the way he looks, he does just burst out and say, I am not. I'm not an animal. And it's this big moment for him, I think, where he finally kind of claims his voice. After that, you pretty much have the opera scene and then his decision to to kill himself. One thing um, that is interesting is that um, the film, in the film, he's referred to as John, John Merrick is his name. In Treb's memoirs, John Merrick is his name. In real life, Joseph Merrick is his name. What does it say about Treve's actual relationship with him that he got his name wrong did, was it intentional is is it does it imply that perhaps Treve's memoirs were not entirely the truth or trying to distance himself in case of any legal possibilities or or does he did he just actually this man that he wants to show the world that he was oh I was great friends with this guy the, the elephant man he actually forgot his name but it's just it's something I definitely thought about the nature of biopics um, you know to what extent um, 
are they responsible for telling the truth? Whose truth? And if this is based on the memoirs, which Lynch says, no, it's not. It's based on, on the truth. This is the true story. He getting the name wrong. It, it's, it's another sign that this is Treve's perception of the Elephant Man more than it is from the Elephant Man's point of view himself. Every account of it is going to be apocryphal, isn't it? Like no one was actually yes. there and is still alive to write about it. So it's all kind of information that's been passed down the, down the line. And yeah, I don't know why Treves didn't know his name, I guess. Was it published while he was still alive? Maybe he's trying to protect him or something actually no i think it was af- it was after america died but um treves then lived into the 1930s the actual real life um place where um this man called mr norman who bites the keeper of him was he kept him in the building's still there just as this film was able to show victorian london so effectively because a lot of those buildings were still there in 1980 that building is now a sari shop the setting is still very much there this is really not that long ago if you think about it um it's incredible how terrible a life like merrick was sort of barbaric the treatment of him was um crazy thinking about what they didn't really know i think even charles darwin didn't know that one sperm fertilized egg so it's weird to think about these kind of misconceptions that went back there and i think it was still a pretty commonly held belief back then that the, you could have a trauma during pregnancy and it would cause like psychological trauma rather than physical trauma obviously and that would cause your child to be deformed and i think even merrick himself believed that that was why he was that way for mo- for all of his life and he, he believes himself to be a disappointment to his mother doesn't he that's something that comes up in the film and when he meets with treves and his wife at Treves family home he's just stunned that he's been invited in for tea and that they're um showing him the photos of their family and that that's one of the saddest scenes and um treves wife starts crying and apologizes because um she's just humbled by how um, sweet Merrick is compared to how um, how awful his life has been. At one point uh, near the beginning of the film when Treves doesn't know much about Merrick yet, I hope he's an idiot. But he does say that, doesn't he, I think? Because it would be better not to be aware of how awful his treatment has been. Yeah, and when you do find out that he's a guy who's able to memorise large stretches of the Bible and does have like an active brain underneath this exterior that most people can't see past, that is especially heartbreaking. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Next week, the next time will be June, which will be uh, more fun, hopefully, than this. Yeah, but this is a very important film. It's a very good film. I don't think it's one I'm going to watch again in the near future. Probably one day I will watch it again because it is very good. So, how many testicles out of five would you give it? Well, it's got to be five, but whatever you're measuring it. <laughs> this is uh, where we're going to end with every Lynch film. Either five or zero. Five there's no, there's zero. no middle ground. Definitely one I'd recommend it in a way that um, a raise our head. I would recommend with a disclaimer whereas uh, the elephant man is just doesn't matter how old you are or uh, what films you like you should see it yeah I definitely I, put I, it over I, I, a head. I think a head was very good but the elephant man is I don't know it's, it's ability to make you feel things is a lot stronger than a razor head made you feel like certain kind of visceral horrible things but elephant man actually makes you feel compassion just admiring his strength and being able to keep going and not giving up and living as good a life as he could the things that are good about this film uh, are kind of universal in their appeal whereas uh, a razor head is um, not I think it's fair to say <laughs> like I'd watch yeah. this film with my parents I wouldn't watch a razor head with my parents I guess the very final scene after after the elephant man lies down you know resigning himself to uh, potentially not waking up again it's sort of a death dream zooming through the heavens stars are flying past and then an image of his mother appears and um, she's reciting Tennyson nothing will die it's sort of quite unsettling and also quite comforting at the same time and then it just sort of ends pretty abruptly yeah he likes his um beautiful women saying very sinister things in a monotonous voice that's definitely a trope of his it's slightly unsettling isn't it even though it's even though she's comforting him into death well yeah just saying that sounds pretty unsettling But it's, it's a very powerful poem. But she's kind of lying to him in a way, I guess. So she's kind of like reassuring him that he will never die when he is right now dying. So it's maybe like not even supposed to be his real mother, but more like his imagined version of her. Yeah, it's a very uh, distinctive way to end the film. And then it comes back in with the gothic font, which they use in the razor head as well. He does both the credits for razor head in this, and it's very gothic font. I miss that. You don't get that in films anymore. Like the pre- the credits at the start, you just get like a title sequence. Very old school. And the smoke. Smoke and 
and fire. He loves his smoke and fire. Yeah, he, he's very. He, there's a lot of sort of physical effects, isn't there, in the sort of dream sequences, like dealing with the elephants and then the smoke and the baby crying at the end. It's, it's hard to, as a layman watching, understand how he would have filmed that in 1980. I, I just don't know. And interesting about being black and white, this is um, the year that Raging Bull won the Oscar, I think, Best Picture, um, and that was shot in black and white as well. Did this, this get any like awards attention or anything? I don't think it did because superficially you could argue it's very so-called Oscar baity, couldn't you, in terms of themes? Was that even a thing though back in the eighties? Like, can I imagine people making like hashtag important films? Maybe not in the same way now that there is a film that comes out every year that is very much like the Oscar film. Daniel Day Lewis has decided to become a Victorian ferryman for a month, and we all have to watch him. So it had nominations. It was nominated for best picture, best director, best adapted screenplay, and best actor in response to because the makeup effects were so impressive the academy created a new award afterwards best makeup and hairstyling was created because um people were shocked that there was no way to give any credit for what was quite a remarkable feat yeah it has its own wikipedia page just for the awards and accolades it's received so you know it's pretty well like for a couple of baftas it won john hurt won best actor technically counts as a british film i know there's like a weird criteria it's like a point system you get like one point if it's set in britain you get two points if it was filmed in britain and very various other amount of points based on the, the cast and crew and whether they're British or not and that qualifies you to as whether you're a, once you hit a certain threshold you become a British film and if you're below that then you're not obviously it does count as a British film by some arbitrary metric and then did David Lynch ever really see re, like kind of get mainstream success I know his um like weird Wizard of Oz Nicolas Cage one from the 90s I think that one the Palme d'Or at Cannes but I'm always suspicious of those things at Cannes because it's always like this got the longest standing ovation ever seven minutes <laughs> and by that point it's just ridiculous isn't it at that point people are literally just trying to break a record like they're not genuinely standing up anymore there's always like certain members of the audience walked out in disgust at the premiere at <laughs> it's always some kind of press whether negative or positive Twin Peaks had pretty mainstream appeal didn't it yeah I mean it was really big at the time it kind of falls apart in the second season when they ran out of things to do yeah so next time June should we do a little preamble to June how how familiar with June are you? Not at all I'm looking forward to it yeah um, and so this this was sort of uh, not a success was it? Toto did the soundtrack so that should answer your question <laughs>